and we're now going to look at some applications for these inequalities. So we're still in 2.9, but these are much, much easier to set up and work through than any of the others. So I'm going to work through about three of these from our textbook here, maybe four if we need to, and then work on our practice exam. Our exam is going to be next week. So I'm going to be on page 194, and we're going to look at question 72. So 194, we're going to look at question 72. And there's a couple of these in your homework as well. We need to write these as an inequality. And so it says, less than one inch of rain fell. So less than one inch of rain. We want to use X to represent the amount of rain that, we, that fell. We want it to be less than one. So we've got our X. Now we want it to be less than one. So it's going to point towards the X or open towards the one. Okay. We want to make sure that it, it looks like that X is less than one. Inequality is always open towards the bigger number. So when, it, when you write it like this, this says x is less than 1. And that's what we want because it says less than 1 inch of rain fell. So that was question 72. Uh, let's look at one more of these just to make sure we can set them up correctly. 74. A full-time student must take at least 12 hours. Okay, so we want at least 12 hours. That means it could equal 12. So we must take at least 12 hours. So we've got our X. Now, we want at least, so that means 12 hours or more. So we want it to be greater than or equal to 12. It's opening towards the X because the X is the bigger number. Right? We want at least 12, so it can be 12 hours or more, and at least means we have the bar there. So those two are just setting up the inequality. Now let's look at one that has an average. Question 82. So this is an average. Now, how do we find the average? We add up all the numbers, right? We divide by how many that we have. So the average monthly precipitation in New Orleans, Louisiana, for June, July, and August is 6.7 inches. If 8.1 inches fall in June, 5.7 falls in July, how many are going to have to fall in August so that the average monthly precip precipitation for these months exceeds 6.7. So we need to figure out what we've got here. Now we've got an average. And our average is going to be that 6.7. Okay, so the average is going to be that 6.7. And we want this average, if you read that last line, it says we want the average monthly precipitation for those months to exceed 6.7. So that means we want our average to be greater than the 6.7. 6.7 is our average. When we work it out, we want our average to be greater. Now, what months are we looking at? We are looking at June, July, and August. Now, if I'm looking at an average, remember, I divide by how many months I have. So I've got three months, so I'm going to have to divide by three. That's how you do an average, right? You add them all together, and in this case, you divide by how many months you have. So you've got three months. So we divide by 3. Now, what do we know about these months? When we read it, it says August 
or sorry, uh, June, July, and August is a 6.7, so that's our average. 8.1 falls in June. So 8.1 is for June. Uh, let's see. We've got 5.7 in July. Right? If we read it, we get those numbers from our, our application. We don't know how many inches of rainfall we need in August, so we're going to use an X. And then that's still over 3. And then you've got our 6.7. So let's, let's recap a little bit about what we did here. We read it, and we found out the average. And when we read that question, it said we wanted the average to be more than that 6.7. So that's what we wanted. Okay, so we want that average to be more than 6.7. Now, what are we averaging? We're averaging for three months of rain. So that's June, July, and August. So they're going to be divided by three because there's three of them. We knew the value of June. We knew the value of July. We did not know the value of August, so we're going to call that X. Now we can clean this up and solve it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the calculator, and I'm going to add that 8.1 and that 5.7 together. And that's going to give me then the 13.8 plus x over 3 is greater than that 6.7. How do we finish it from here? How do we clear that fraction? We cross multiply. And we learned this, this technique a couple weeks ago. So cross multiply. We're going to go ahead and cross multiply here. So that gives you 13.8 plus x. Inequality symbol stays the same. And then on the right, we've got 3 times that 6.7. And that gives you 20.1. Move that 13.8 over. And then we'll have our, our answer. So x is now greater than 6.3. And how do we express this in words? Well, we need six point three inches or more. Sorry, well. Let me, let me write, we need 6.3, let me write, so it sounds right, sorry about that, let me get it, where's what we want, we want this to be greater than, not greater than or equal to, so it's greater than, so we need more than 6.3 inches of rain in August. So that's going to answer our question. We need more than 6.3 inches of rain in August. And why is it more than? Well, because we want to make sure we have more than that 6.3, sorry, that 6.7 inches average. So that's how we would, we would work that out there. So set it up, use the average, and solve it. 86 is very, very similar to a question in your homework. It's almost identical. It's just different numbers. So 86. So for question 86, we've got the formula for converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. So the Fahrenheit temperature of Phoenix has never exceeded 122 degrees. How would you describe this using the Celsius temperature? So we're, we're going to have to convert. So 
So here's our formula. F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. Now we're looking at the temperature in Phoenix. We will talk about the inequality at the end. But we're looking at the temperature in Phoenix. And it says that temperature in Phoenix has never been over 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So we want to convert this to Celsius. So we want to take that and we want to find our C, our Celsius temperature. So we're going to plug in our 122. And we're going to solve it. Okay, so we'll plug in our 122 for F because that's the Fahrenheit temperature of Phoenix. We're going to clear out our fractions by multiplying it by 5. That's going to clear out our fractions here. And we'll probably need a calculator. So let's go ahead and multiply. We've got 122 times 5. That's 610. We've got 9C. And then 32 times 5. That gives you 160. So we've cleared out our fractions. Move that 160 over. And that gives you now 610 minus 160. That's 450. Equals that 9C. We'll divide by our 9. And then that gives us our C. That comes out to be 50 degrees. Now, what does it say? Okay, if we read it, we've got that 50 degrees. Let's, let's read the last line of our problem. And I'll put the work back up here in just a second. So the Fahrenheit temperature of Phoenix has never exceeded 122 degrees. And how would you describe this using the Celsius temperature? Well, what do we define? What do we find the Celsius temperature to be? 50 degrees. So what are we going to say? The Celsius temperature has never exceeded 50 degrees. So we just rewrote it with the correct um, temperature. So the Celsius temperature has never exceeded 50 degrees. That's all you needed to do is to use that formula. Now, that is going to look very, very similar, almost identical to question 10 in your homework. Okay, same formula, same everything. Convert it, rewrite it. That's it. Okay, just convert it. It's the, they give you the Celsius one instead of the Fahrenheit one, but you'll plug the numbers in, rewrite the temperature, and reword it. We've done an average. We have done a temperature one. Now let's look at a perimeter problem. So question 87. So we're going to look at question 87 next. And this is going to be a perimeter problem. <coughs> and then I'll help you set up question 9 from your homework. So we'll do 87 out of our textbook. And then I'll set up question 9. Now 87 is going to be very, very similar. Almost identical to question 12. Right? Here's question 12. Here's question 87. For what values of x would the rectangle have a perimeter of at least 400? So we want that perimeter to be at least 400. So what does it mean when we say at least 400? 
that means it's going to be greater than or equal to. So that means our perimeter is greater than or equal to 400. As a side note, what's the perimeter? Just as a side note, the perimeter is the sum of all the sides. Okay, so the perimeter is going to be the sum of all the sides. So that's just a side note there. Whenever we have a perimeter, for whatever figure, add up all the sides. So our figure is a rectangle, just like the one in your homework. And it's 4x plus 3 and x plus 37. And I'm going to go ahead and fill in the other two sides, because this is x plus 37, and this one's also x plus 3. So I went ahead and got our, our, tri, our, sorry, our rectangle, and I labeled all the sides here. Now the perimeter, we know that's adding up all the sides. So we're going to go ahead and add these all up. So for their perimeter, we have 4x plus 3 plus x plus 37, plus 4x plus 3, plus x plus 37, and that's going to be greater than or equal to 400, because this is your perimeter. Okay, that's what we're doing. So we're just going to add up all of our sides here, and we're going to make sure that that's going to be greater than or equal to our 400. adding up all of our values here. Okay, when we add them up, let's see how many x's we got. We got 4, 5, 4 more makes 9, another one makes it 10. So we have 10x, and now we'll add up our values here, our numbers. So we've got 3 and 37, that's 40. Another 40 makes it 80. Added up our terms together, because 3 and 37 makes it 40, another 40 makes it 80. Now we can finish it. So move that 8 over, sorry, the 80 over. And 10x is now greater than or equal to 320. Divide by our 10. Do we switch our inequality sign, yes or no? No, why not? When we're dividing by a positive number, right? When do we change the inequality symbol? When we divide by a negative. At the very last step, are we dividing by a negative number? No. So it stays the same. So that tells you then that x is going to be what? Greater than or equal to 32. So if you write that out in words, then x must be at least... 32. So x has got to be at least 32 in words. So that's how we solved it. Now this is going to be almost identical to question 12. You do the exact same thing for question 12. You've got your rectangle. You put the extra sides on. You add them up. And they add up to be at least that 152. Almost identical to the one we just did. I am going to set up question 9 from your homework. Because the others we've done, an example of each one. I'm now going to set up question 9. So I'll do part... A, B, and C, you're going to have to solve it and talk about D. So I'll do parts A, B, and C. And for question 9, we've got an application. And in the business world, there's two things that we worry about. We worry about revenue and cost. Okay? And they go together, they subtract from each other to give you the profit. 
We want to make sure that our revenue is always bigger than our cost. And if they equal each other, they, they break even. So we've got revenue, cost, and the subtraction of the two, the difference of the two, gives you then your profit. We're going to try to write an expression for each of, each of these. So a company that produces appliances has found that the revenue from the sales of appliances is $50 per appliance less the sales cost of $200. Production costs are $350 plus $40 per appliance. And the profit is given by the revenue minus the cost. So we're going to look at Part A. Part A says, write an expression for the revenue. Letting X represent the production level, number of appliances produced. And so when we talk about the revenue, and let's, let's try to focus on this. We're almost finished for the day. There's not that much left. We're going to go through this question, and then we're going to look at our practice exam. When we talk about our revenue, how much money do we make on each appliance? So if, we, if we read it, it says a company produces appliances, and they found that the revenue from the sales of appliances is $50 per appliance minus the $200 sales cost. So my revenue is going to be 50x minus 200. $50 per appliance, and we have to take out our sales cost. Everyone okay with that, right? $50 appliance, so that's 50x. X is going to be the number of appliances. And then it says less $200 for the sales cost, so that's the minus there. That's part A. Part B. We're looking at the cost. Write an expression for the cost. Well, when we talk about production costs, the costs are $350 plus $40 per appliance. So my cost is 40x, because it's $40 per appliance, plus $350. And that might be the setup, that might be the rent on the building, whatever it might be, that $350 is just added cost. And the more appliances we produce, of course, the more cost it is, and the more the revenue we get also. So that's part B. Part C. Part C, we want the profit to be greater than zero. So we want to make sure that we make money. Now, what do we know about our profit? It says profit is your revenue minus your cost. Okay, so that's what your profit is. And so when we, we, when we rewrite this, we have our profit to be greater than zero. That's going to be our revenue minus our cost. And let's fill it in. What's our revenue? 50x minus 200 minus our cost, which what's our cost? Use parentheses. Our cost is 40x plus 350. And we want this to be greater than zero. And so you can finish it from here. So you should be able to finish it from here. And that's going to be answer or, or part B. So we've got the revenue, we've got the cost, and we take the revenue minus the cost that gives us our profit. We want to make sure we make money. So we plugged in our values to make sure we did that. And when we solve it, that's going to give us then how many units we have to produce to make a profit. So when we're finished at the end, you get your X. And X is how many we have to produce to make a profit. You always have to add one more because that X is going to be the break even. We want one more after that. Or rather, there's more. But you can finish that out for, for part D. So that now should answer all, 
examples of all the different types of questions from 2.9. Now we're going to spend the last few minutes going through some questions on our practice exam. And I'm going to post a worked out copy of your practice exam. Um, I'll probably either work it out this afternoon or tomorrow, but you'll, you'll see this in your Canvas course, a copy of how I worked it out. But I'm going to focus on the setup of some of these questions. So we're going to try to work out some of these questions, the ones I know we're going to struggle with. So let's look at our practice exam. I'm not going to work them all out. I'm going to focus on the ones that I know we struggle with how to set up. And the first one that I know we struggle with is going to be question 11. We're going to go through and set up these applications. We're not going to solve them. But we're going to set them up. That's where students struggle at, is the setup, not the solving, the setup. The sum of twice a number and five less than the number is the same as the difference between minus 41 and the number. What is our number? Take a moment to look at it again and look at each piece. When I say the sum of twice a number, okay, when I say twice the number, what does that mean? Twice the number, twice that number means 2x. So there's that, it's twice the number, there's that little piece there, and 5 less than the number. So the sum of twice a number. 5 less than the number. So 5 less than the number would be x minus 5, right? Because there's twice the number. We're going to add that to 5 less than the number. Is the same as, that means equals. And what is it the same as? The difference between minus 41 and the number. So that means we're looking at the difference between minus 41 and the number. So that's going to be minus 41 minus x. You can finish it because all I'm doing is setting these up. Okay, I'm going to post the key so you can check your work if you make a mistake somewhere. But this is how you set up the equation. That's where students struggle at is setting it up, not so much solving. It's more about how do I set this up. Okay, question 12 is a percentage problem. Two hundred and seventy cities is what percent or sites? Yeah, what else did At two and seventy cities is what percent of nineteen thirty? Cities. So we're going to look at how these go together. Okay, so 270 versus that 1930. We want to know what percent that 270 is. Okay, so we take our 1930 times x, and that's going to equal then your 270. And x is going to be the percentage. that we want. I'll just go ahead and finish this one out just to make sure you know exactly what I'm looking for here. So we've got it set up. Okay, 1930 times some percentage gives you that 270. I'm going to go ahead and finish this one out just so you understand how to get the correct answer. We're going to divide both sides by 1930. That leaves you then with x equaling, let's use a calculator here, 
it's going to come out to be a decimal. I'm going to make that decimal a percentage. So we've got 270. Divide that by 1930. And that comes out to be 0 0.13989. It goes on forever. Or that's about 14%. Okay, so just round it to the nearest percent. So all you would need to say there is it's about 14%. So we set it up. Now we know it's going to be less than less than 1. It's always going to come out to be a decimal. So we said 1930 times some percentage gives you 270. We divide it and we've got our 14. It's pretty easy to do. It's just a matter of setting it up. And again, I'm going to post this online with all the worked out questions either this afternoon or tomorrow, just like I did with the review for the last set, for the last chapter. So let's try question 13. This is one that I know students struggle with. This is one that the students are very likely to miss. 13. This is the most commonly missed question. It's an investment. Paul invested some money at 4%. 10,000 more than that amount at 4.5%. After one year, his total interest was 1895 So $1,895. How much did he invest at each rate? So this is one of the investment problems. So let's really take our time and make sure we know where all the pieces belong. We've done a lot of these, but no matter how many we do, sometimes students get stuck. So we're going to really focus on this one. We're going to take our time and we're going to talk through where each piece goes. Paul invested some money at 4% simple interest. So, first off, we're going to use that 4%. Does it tell me how much money we put in at 4%? No. Okay, so that piece is going to be our first one, and that's X. Is everyone okay where that came from? Does everyone see how it all goes together? Break it up into small pieces. And 10,000 more than that amount. So 10,000 more than that amount would be X plus the 10,000. Okay. 10,000 more than that amount is X plus 10,000. And that's going at 4.5%. I always like to add these up to get our total amount. And when we add across, that's 2x plus the 10,000. So is everyone comfortable with where I got this piece from? And then those two just go together. This is not so important. I just put this here because if I don't, students will put that, that 1895 here, try to solve it, and they'll get the wrong answer. So I just put this here so we don't make a mistake and, and put the number in the wrong place and solve the wrong equation. So this is what we've got. And we built this. Next, if it's a mixture problem, we have pure. If it's a distance problem, we have the distance we have to find. In this case, it's an interest problem. So we have to find our interest. And what's our interest? Our interest is the amount times the percentage rate. Make those percentages a decimal. 
So on the first one, you multiply these together. So 4% is 0 0.04. How much is in there? Unknown amount X. The next one. What's in the next one? 0 0.045. Make sure you're very careful with the decimals. It's not 0 0.45. You've got to make sure you got that extra zero there. Commonly made mistake. Students won't put enough zero. So make sure you're very careful there. And then how much is in there? X plus your 10,000. Okay. And then what is it going to equal? It's going to equal the total interest that we made, which is that 18 what is it, 95? Yep, 1895. You can finish it from here. Hopefully now it's starting to make a little bit more sense on how to set these up. We've got a little bit of time left. I want to do one more of these. Okay, question 18. We're going to look at 18 next, and this will probably be the last one that we really have time to set up. But I am again going to post these notes along with the worked out key in Canvas either again this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon. So we're going to look now at question 18. This is a distance one. We haven't done a lot of distance problems. But we're going to, again, set this one up, and then you can finish it. From a point on a straight road, two cars are driven in opposite directions. One goes 29 miles an hour. The other goes at 43 miles an hour. In how many hours will they be? 288 miles an hour. When we talk about these distance problems, it can either be addition, subtraction, or they can equal each other. So we've got two cars that are going in opposite directions on a road. The only time that we, sub we subtract is when they overlap each other. These do not overlap, do they? They go in opposite directions, and do not cross each other. So that means this one's going to be addition. Each of these then has a rate and it has a time. Because remember, when we talk about distance and driving a car, there's three things that are involved. How long it takes you to get to your destination, how fast you're going, and how many miles or kilometers away that destination is. So rate time, and distance. Rate and time give you then the distance. So the first car is going at 29 miles an hour. The second car is going at 43 miles an hour. This question, do we know anything at all about the times? Does it tell us the times at all? No, because the time is the missing component, right? We start at the same time, though, so that means both these times are going to be x. So rate and time. And then we need to find our distance. And distance, just like the interest and the pure and the value, is going to be two things multiplied together. So in this case... Your distance is your rate times your time. So what do we have? We have 29x. We have 43x. And that gives you a total distance. Of 288. That's going to be, yep, that's our 288. 
Now let's talk about what's going to happen next week, just so we know what we can bring to our exam next week. So our exam is going to be next week. <clears throat> now, what can you bring for that exam? For the exam, you'll need to bring a calculator. I've got a few if you need one, but if you've got a calculator, please bring your own calculator. In case you forget some, I do have some extras, but try to bring your own calculator. You'll need to bring some scratch paper. So if you want to use some line paper, make sure you bring that. And then you can also have either a page of notes or a stack of note cards. Now, I don't really tell you how many note cards you can have, but you know, if you you don't want to have a whole bunch, but you know, if you want to have 5 or 10, that'd be great. I think note cards will make it easier. If you want to take all these questions and put them on note cards so you can see how they're worded and how it it, it is solved, you can do that. A lot of times in the past, I've had students take the practice test and pick out the, the questions they know they struggle with and put the question on the front and the answer on the back and show the steps so then they can use that on their exams when they see a very, very similar question. They'll know what to do. And also remember to bring in your homework packet. So bring in your completed homework packet. <coughs> Okay, and I will see everyone next week. And next week we'll have our exam. Now remember, you can go into Canvas. I'll send it out as an announcement as well. And you can view how I work out this, this homework, along with all the notes and the video lectures. So they'll all be in Canvas for you.